Um, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Harrison Hong, Professor of Economics uh, at Columbia University. It's my real pleasure to welcome you to uh, the, the, the CFM Columbia PER uh, Alternative Data Initiative uh, Zoom, 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 Zoom conference. Uh, and uh, today, it's my real pleasure uh, to, to welcome uh, Hyun Song Shin, uh, Economic Advisor and Head of Research uh, for the Bank of International Settlements. Uh, Hyun co-heads the Monetary and Economic Department and is part of the bank's senior management and a member of his executive committee. Uh, and we were able uh, to get uh, Hyun uh, because uh, Hyun, myself, Jose, Rafael, Matthew Gomez, uh, we're all sort of a uh, at Princeton at the same time. Uh, and so we were work that connection and, and, and get Hyun to take some time from his busy schedule. Uh, Hyun, uh, uh, you know, before being a uh, professor at Princeton, he was also a professor at Oxford and, and at the London School of Economics for a number of years. Uh, Hyun has really uh, written extensively on so many issues. Uh, it, I think it's not an understatement to say he's really one of the preeminent voices when it comes to uh, uh, banking and international uh, monetary issues. Uh, he, he does a number of things at, 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 at BIS in terms of initiatives, including uh, digital payments, et cetera. But Today, uh, he's going to talk about uh, his, his work on uh, global value chains uh, with the BIS uh, economists. Uh, so I'm going to just bring Adam a few words before we let him begin his uh, lecture. Adam? Um, hello, everyone. Um, CFM per alternative data initiative has been launched because of how important alternative data has become in investing and economics. Uh, the joint initiative enables uh, PhD students to use alternative data sets in their research projects and provides a platform for cross-collaboration between academics and investment professionals. While many of the alternative data sources are novel and previously unexplored, um, it is important to maintain the same high standards of academic rigor when examining their usefulness in explaining stock market and economic phenomena. Also, as a part of the CFM per alternative data initiative, we periodically organize seminars uh, on data sets and research that are timely. And today's edition focuses on global supply chains. I'm excited to learn how Hyun thinks about them. Thank you, and back to you, Harrison. Hyun, the floor is yours. Please, uh, you can share your slides. Thank you, Harrison, um, and thank you, Jose. It's really uh, fantastic to uh, to see you both. Let me just share my screen. Make sure that you can see the see that. Can you see that? Yeah. Can you put it to uh, full screen? I guess is it full screen? Yeah, so that's full screen. Okay, excellent. Um, well, it's a great pleasure to join you. And uh, as as Harrison said, um, you know, we we spent our best days at Princeton together, and uh, we were all uh, in a row of offices in the Bendheim Center for Finance. Uh, Jose was actually next door to me. Uh, we had uh, you know great discussions, um, and it turns out that uh, you know those times. Uh, really have a lot of uh, you know resonance for the story that I'll actually tell you, because um, you know the the standard story about global value chains is that, and actually the state of globalization more generally, um, is that it's been you know um, the narrative is shaped by the sequence of really extraordinary shocks that have hit the global economy, uh, and so. Uh, we all know the initial COVID shock and the economic shutdowns. Uh, you know that really loomed large in the initial um, commentary. And then with the reopening of the global economy, we had bottlenecks um, that uh, really uh, uh, restricted key nodes in the in the uh, network uh, of trade, and it rippled through the system with shortages coexisting with. You know, localized gluts. So, you know, we had lots of um, discussions about, uh, you know, this feast and famine phenomenon, um, where you seem to have uh, very uh, severe shortages in some of the commodities in some locations, coexisting with uh, localized gluts in 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 some commodities. And then it came the war in Ukraine uh, and the ongoing geopolitical tensions. And that's actually led to a lot of the, uh, if you like, the uh, the commentary, uh, for example, in the uh, meetings at Davos uh, 
about uh, the deglobalization, um, about you know deglobalization and how uh, we with, we're entering a new age. What I want to do though is to is to put forward an alternative view. So um, yes, these kinds of uh, stories that we these kind of commentaries that we've been um, uh, that uh, you know that we've been hearing definitely have a role to play. But actually, uh, in, in the spirit of this seminar series, if we look at the data, um, it turns out that peak globalization, at least measured in terms of global trade, uh, was reached before the great financial crisis of 2008. So indeed, it was a time when Jose Harrison and I were um, in the Bendheim Center, uh, you know, before the crisis, that was really the the period when uh, you know we had peak globalization, <clears throat> and global trade, as you'll see, has pretty much stagnated thereafter. Uh, so you know this is of course measured by reference to um, real economic activity, uh, world world GDP, for example. And indeed, um, if you look at uh, the data, peak globalization in terms of trade tracks very closely the peak globalization in terms of financial flows. Uh, and so looking at the data, it really is uh, quite suggestive that financial and real globalization are really two sides of the same coin. And I think the clue here is that trade is incredibly finance intensive, especially when you have very, very elaborate supply chains. Um, and so this, uh, two sides of the same coin type phenomenon between trade and finance um, really reflects this highly finance intensive uh, nature of trade. And, you know, with that kind of perspective, it's actually quite interesting to go in and uh, dig a little bit deeper. And what I'll do is show you uh, some pretty suggestive evidence that um, if we have a good measure of um, broad global financial conditions, trade itself is going to follow the ups and downs of that measure. And in particular, it turns out that the, the dollar itself, so the broad dollar index, tends to play um, a very good role as a proxy for uh, broad um, uh, global financial conditions. And so when we look ahead, so uh, um, of course, you know, it's gonna be very difficult to make predictions, but as we look ahead to the extent that the same types of relationships uh, will continue to hold. We can expect, um, you know, some um, some ups and downs that you know will actually follow uh, financial conditions as given by, uh, for example, the broad dollar. So what I will do is just to take you through a couple of charts just to set the stage. So um, clearly, global trade has grown very strongly in the age of globalization. You know, we had a little bit of a blip during the GFC. Uh, and I don't know whether you can see my cursor, but that's the GFC here. And then of course, uh, during the initial stages of the, of the COVID shock. Uh, but trade also has a, has a price index. So, you know, this is in real terms. Um, and I'm measuring here everything in terms of uh, Q1 $2,000. So these are Q1 $2,000 as deflated by the by the trade price index. If we um, if we look at uh, global GDP, of course, that's also grown tremendously. Uh, and you know, this is um, real GDP in Q1 $2,000. What if we take the ratio? I think this is the asset test. And um, what we see is this really striking chart where Global trade uh, in real terms as a fraction of global GDP in real terms. I'm sorry, am I the only one who lost the screen? Ah, uh, have, have you, can you, yeah. let me try sharing again. How is that? Okay, good, excellent. Sorry yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so what, what you missed was basically, you know, real trade, real GDP, and the ratio of the two. And you can see from this chart that uh, um, real trade to real GDP, that peaked in 2007. 
So here, Sorry, would you, would you mind is. minimizing your Zoom um, because it hides part of the screen? Ah, okay, sorry. Thank you very much. Not, ah, okay, very good, sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, the problem with uh, with this is that I'm not, sh I don't know what you can see, so. <laughs> yeah, now we can see your your graph, yeah, excellent. it's perfect. Excellent, excellent. The word GDP. <laughs> very good, yeah, so here it is. So uh, goods exports to GDP, both in real terms, they're different uh, deflators. I mean, GDP is primarily services, exports primarily goods, uh, as you'll see shortly. And so, you know, they they need their own deflator. And this is the ratio of the of the real to the real. It really grew tremendously um, in the golden age of globalization. It peaked just here, um, just before the GFC. Uh, it really did very sharply. Then it bounced back. But then since, you know, ever since uh 2011 2010 it's been stagnating so if you are really interested in the question you know when was the start of the of the you know if if you believe that there is deglobalization happening um and it's been driven it, uh, and it's being driven by covid it's been it's being driven by geopolitics well actually i have news for you because it out it if you look at the data it started a lot earlier and what does this chart resemble? Well, this is where um, I think uh, you know my perch here at the BIS gives me quite a good vantage point. Fascinating. There are lots of ways of uh, there are lots of ways of measuring you know global finance, and so here's one way, which is just uh, the total cross-border bank lending relative to world GDP. So um, I've uh, separated out different. Uh, um, banking systems. So depending on whether the headquarters are in the euro area, the US or, or Japan or in other European um, countries. But this is the this is the aggregate. The black line is the is the is the total. So if you look at uh, global banking activity and just add it all up um, as measured by cross border claims, um, it peaked as a proportion of world GDP exactly here. And uh, it reached something above 50% of global GDP. But since then, it's really been fluctu uh, it's really been stagnating thereafter. Of course, uh, you know, if we look at the, uh, the if we look at just the, um, the, you know, dollar amounts, that's been pretty flat. But what we're doing here, of course, is to normalize by, uh, normalize by, um, by world GDP. And hence this, you know, downward sloping uh, chart. We have a little bit of an uptick here, um, but then as we hit the COVID period, uh, you know, it's been it's been pretty subdued. By the way, there is a there is another story which I won't have time to tell you. You can see that it's the yellow, uh, which has seen the biggest ups and downs. It's really um, you know this is a story about European banks mainly. It's actually European banks intermediating dollars. This was the subject of my. IMF Mandel Fleming lecture, uh, you know, some time ago. Um, if you add European banks from the euro area here in yellow, and other European banks here in blue, it really is a huge chunk of global banking. Uh, but that's another story. I, you know, I don't have time to get into that. But in the aggregate, essentially, if we look at global uh, banking and global trade. They both, um, th there's a kind of certain resemblance here to the two series. They both peak um, just before the global financial crisis. Now, why might that be? So um, it turns out that when we look at the, the trade data, and this is uh, from the World Bank, and just ask what are the components of trade that has grown fastest? Well, the answer turns out to be it's manufacturing. So um, if you um, break out the various categories of trade um, into its different components, and we're measuring things here by global GDP, it's really the gray bar which sees this tremendous increase you know, as a percentage of global GDP. So 1965, 1985, you can see the growth there. 2007, look at that. We see this huge growth in manufacturing trade. And ever since, uh, that's been stagnating. 
if we look at the other components, in particular services, you know, that's pretty much, you know, that has grown, but it's um, pretty much kept pace with global GDP itself. The other components like fuel, food, uh, ores and metals, other raw materials, they've really been quite small. It's really the, uh, the, the manufacturing sector that has really driven uh, the growth in trade and which has also suffered uh, the, uh, the, the stagnation in trade uh, ever since. Now, one way to approach this is actually to uh, think about what happens when you're trying to uh, organize and maintain a global value chain. And you may remember this book by Tom Friedman, um, who wrote this book called The World is Flat. It was kind of, you know, anthem to globalization. It came out in the early 2000s. And he's interviewing the CEO of UPS. And this is what the CEO says. Uh, and they're talking about inventories. When our grandfathers owned shops, inventory was what was in the back room. Now it's a box two hours away on a package car, or it might be hundreds more crossing the country by rail or jet, and then you have thousands more crossing the ocean. So inventory is not just stuck you know, in the back room, it's actually moving around. So um, I think what this gives you is a sense of uh, um, the kind of time delay between incurring costs and receiving cash flows. Let me give you a quick example, just to uh, illustrate what I have in mind. So imagine that you're running a value chain, you're a global uh, auto manufacturer, you assemble the engine, let's say in Canada, and then you ship it to Mexico uh, for the following period, and you combine it with a chassis. And then after some time, you can ship the, uh, the whole uh, intermediate good somewhere in the US, and they will complete the car. So it's a three period production problem with three stages. Now in the meanwhile, of course, as you're doing this, you're starting off another engine here, and another engine here. And so at any one time, you're carrying a lot of inventory. So what are you doing? You're carrying uh, you know, an almost completed car. You're also carrying a car which is semi-complete with the engine and the chassis. And you're also carrying an engine. And you can imagine that uh, if the supply chain is more complicated, your inventories are going to be much, uh, you know, much more elaborate. So, um, this idea of inventories not being just a buffer stock. You know, we tend to think of inventories uh, in simple models in terms of the SS model. You know, it's really a kind of buffer stock that you have just to shield you from shocks. Well, actually inventories move around. It's not a buffer stock. It's actually something that you have to carry on your balance sheet. So what are the balance sheet implications? Well, let's just think about this. So that engine, it's one period old, let's call that V. Um, that's the value that you carry your inventory. You have to finance that with short-term debt. But then as you um, move to the next stage, you're putting more value at it. It's a two period old inventory. It's more valuable because it has two lots of value added. Let's call that 2V just for the sake of argument. And that almost complete car is gonna have a value of 3V. Now, all of these things have to be financed on your balance sheet. And typically this will be financed through, uh, through bank lending. And if you have four, then it's gonna be four plus three plus two plus one. So it's, it's the sum of an arithmetic series. Uh, if you like, it's the area of the triangle. And the area of the triangle, as we know, is increasing at the rate, the square of the length of the chain. So there's a non-linearity that, that kicks in, uh, which means that if you're going to maintain a very elaborate uh, value chain, you're gonna need a lot of these inventories uh, to actually you know, maintain that supply chain. And this is very, very finance intensive. And if you like, the incremental financing need of extending your value chain by one notch, when your value chain is already very long, that's a hugely um, uh, that's a huge increase in the financing requirement relative to what you would do if uh, you're starting out from scratch. 
or indeed if you're uh, engaged in trade, uh, not in manufacturing, but something else like uh, you know, raw materials. So um, I was just uh, you know, chatting with Jose and Harrison earlier. Uh, there's a very old paper that I have with Cedric Kim, uh, which uh, you know, we, we have sort of revamped and it's now posted as a BIS working paper in case you're interested in the macro implications of this kind of setup. So how does this actually allow us to shed light on, on this green segment? So you know, this is the chart that you saw before. It's the, it's the trade to GDP ratio. And I've just put a green uh, rectangle around the period that we're interested in. Let's just focus on the period um, from the year 2000. And if we then ask, well, you know, what does, uh, okay, have I lost, um, let me just check, you can still see, have I lost the screen? Let me just uh, share yes, again. Yes, unfortunately, sorry. Okay, let me, let me share the screen again. I think you can see it now, good. Um, so what if we then magnify this bit? And so, you know, this is the same chart from the year 2000. Um, it's all in um, Q1, $2,000. And so the ratio of trade to GDP uh, in real terms, it fluctuates between 15 to you know, 20%. And it has this shape, which is quite you know, interesting. So here we start off, trade starts to go up. This is the period when uh, we have a great deal of financial excess, especially in the mortgage market. But this was a period when we had a great deal of um, you know, quite accommodative financial conditions. Then comes a crisis, trade really drops relative to GDP. Then it bounces back as the uh, global economy comes back. And then since then we see this stagnation. Um, and even with the, uh, and even with the COVID shock, uh, you know, we see the stagnation. It hasn't really got back to the peak uh, globalization. And this chart is uh, coming from my paper with Valentina Bruno. Uh, it's um, so here's the link, uh, and we actually sort of you know look at this and uh, look at much more the micro uh, dimension to this, and it turns out that there is a reflected symmetry here. So if you really want to understand what's going on, and the idea here is trade, especially in manufacturing, especially in global value chains, is very highly finance intensive, and so when you're thinking about either extending or shrinking, the terms of that trade-off really depend on the financing cost that you need to extend or shrink. And it turns out that it's the black line that serves as a very, very good proxy for those financial conditions. And it's the broad dollar index itself. So other, thing, other things being equal, when the dollar is weak, this is when financial conditions are very accommodative. Remember, the early 2000s was a period when the dollar was actually weakening quite a bit. And then came the GFC, the dollar shot up. And then it uh, uh, eased back again as stress is eased. But then, you know, we've had this period from around 2014, when the dollar has been really quite strong. I'll show you a longer term series uh, in a minute, but um, the most recent period is really quite, uh, um, is really quite remarkable in that um, it's very close to the strength of the dollar we saw, we last saw in the mid 1980s. Uh, 1985 was really the peak uh, of the strength of the dollar. This was when um, international negotiations led to the, uh, the Plaza Accord, um, and there were you know, very, very large tectonic shifts. It turns out that um, you know, we didn't quite break the record this time, but we came close actually. And so um, the storyline here is if we think about financial conditions, in particular, that uh, restriction in, in global banking that we saw earlier. So you know, I showed you this chart as a, as a summary of um, how subdued global banking activity has been since the GFC. Well, um, you know, there's a good reason if you believe that it's very finance intensive and at the margin, it's the financing conditions, 
that really determine uh, how long or how elaborate you want that uh, value chain to be, then clearly this is, uh, this is going to enter into uh, you know, the argument. And in this paper, um, what we show is that we, we, you know, we can show through a micro data set that actually uh, the, financial, um, the financial factors really uh, you know, enter into uh, export decisions in a, in a very uh, substantial way. But you can see already that even in the aggregate, you can see something uh, is happening here. Now, um, I was uh, in Korea recently, and Korea is really quite an amazing country. Well, it's amazing in many ways, but one of the ways that it's amazing is that it uh, it has this incredibly um, timely trade statistics. So whereas you know you, uh, in other countries you have to wait a few days or even weeks to get the latest trade data. Uh, in Korea, you get the monthly trade data at, you know, uh, on the first day of the following month. It's really, really very, very made, very, very timely. And so when you look at Korea over the uh, COVID period, it's just an amazing chart. The green line here is the annual growth rate of trade. Um, it's the annual growth rate of goods exports. And the black line is the line that you saw earlier. It's the uh, annual change in the broad dollar index. And you see this uh, incredible reflected symmetry here. It's when the dollar is weak or weakening that you see um, trade going up. It's when the dollar is strong that you see trade coming down. What's really amazing about this chart, and let me just draw your attention to what happened in the summer of 2021. If you recall, this was a time when bottlenecks were at their worst. This was a time when, you know, bullwhip effects, all the uh, supply restrictions were at their worst. Well, actually, that was a time when Korean exports were growing at their fastest rate. Now, some of it has to do with semiconductor prices. Um, you know, I haven't adjusted for the, for the prices here. But uh, uh, even just for the, for the values, you see this uh, very negative correlation. And just on a simple calculation, the correlation between these two series is uh, uh, minus 0.6. What's happened recently, of course, is that uh, the dollar has been very strong. Korean won, the Korean won was one of the, cur uh, was one of the currencies that was hit hardest by the uh, strength of the dollar. You might think, well, the textbooks say, if your currency is weak, this is when your exports should be uh, really you know, strongest. Well, actually, no. Uh, exports turned negative last autumn. And the latest data is that it's, uh, it's going further negative. There's a little bit of a delay with the dollar, obviously. But if you were hoping to see a rebound in exports due to the depreciation of the Korean won, this is not what you're seeing. And it makes perfect sense for Korea because you know, Korea is very much part of the global value chain networks. It's highly uh, connected with the Asian global value chain networks. The biggest components have to do with intermediate goods. And if you're shipping intermediate goods and back and forth with China, for example, it's very uh, closely integrated in that sense. Um, this is gonna be highly finance intensive. Now, um, just to give you a few other charts, just to, just to convince you that uh, the broad dollar index does a credible job as a proxy for broader financial conditions. Um, here's a chart that shows um, the annual growth of um, dollar denominated credit. So either uh, total credit here in the solid line or loans from banks. And the black line is the four quarter change in the broad dollar index. And again, you see this reflected symmetry. If you want to look at uh, trade credit more directly, well, uh, you know, we actually have data on that. Uh, we ask the central banks to give us uh, their latest data on trade credit um, supplied by banks. And again, that conforms pretty closely to this reflected symmetry. You have this uh, mountains and lakes picture. Um, when one goes up, the other one goes down. There's a sort of broader point here, um, which is about the way that we look at the, the global trading system. So, you know, we are accustomed, I think, 
to seeing the global economy in terms of the island economy model. So every country is an island. The you know uh, intermediate. So uh, it's the relative prices that intermediate between the real activity across islands, and ultimately it's the exchange rate that uh, is going to determine the equilibrium, the trade equilibrium. Well, actually, it um, if you think about it, it's better to think about this uh, more as uh, a network of interconnected balance sheets. Yeah. So if you like, this is the better picture. So rather than thinking about islands, you know, these are firms that straddle um, countries and it straddles the different sectors. So these are charts that um, were uh, produced by some BIS staff. Um, every dot is a company in capital IQ. Wow. The size of the dot uh, gives the size of total assets. And the, and the colors give you um, the headquarter country. And what and what you can see is that you know it's a it's a very very interconnected series. The positioning here um, is uh, in terms of centrality. So it's the fixed point calculation. It's like uh, having the Google rankings of uh, of you know web pages. Um, it's the companies that are connected with more central companies that are appearing in the middle of this chart. And you see that it's um, you know it's an incredibly intricate web it's not you know these are not islands and they're all you know interconnected through the balance sheets so these are across countries and global chains are, uh, and global value chains are also networks of balance sheets across industries so uh you know here red is the it sector and it's the same set of firms here so you know we can triangulate um so you know here's an asian company so here's a korean company here that's in the it sector uh and you can sort of you know, pretty much guess what that company is across sectors it's also uh, a web of these interconnections so rather than thinking about trade in terms of uh, the island economy model i think it really does push us towards an alternative view these are really balance sheets that are interconnected highly integrated highly finance intensive and this is where i think um you know it's the it's a training both in terms of the real economy and in terms of finance. And you know, to put it all, if you can actually have uh, the technical training to think about the networks, I think that's the kind of combination of skills that will really come in handy. So let me conclude uh, with a kind of you know um, a quick look ahead. So if this is all true, and you believe uh, some of my stories. Um, a lot will depend on where the dollar is headed next year or this year. Now, one very uh, important backdrop here is what inflation will do. And here are the inflation rates across these economies. And here are the, uh, the forecasts for the end of the year. We're expecting inflation to moderate. And to that extent, we're expecting uh, monetary tightening to be more commensurate with the, with the lower inflation. We're also seeing a moderation of commodity prices. So, you know, if we look at the oil price, if we uh, look at the price of oil, it clearly peaked with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But lately, uh, commodity prices have been really quite subdued. And this is an interesting chart. So the New York Fed has an index of global supply chain pressures. Um, and this is the black chart here. You see what, um, you see how tight this measure is in 2011. Well, if you recall the chart that I showed you for Korea, that was when Korean exports were booming, right? And so, if you if you were thinking that uh, these uh, you know these uh, bottlenecks are really going to hold back trade, well, guess what? Uh, trade was really booming in those days. You know, in a way, it was because trade was booming that some of these uh, uh, supply chain indices were showing you know strains. And here are the PMI. Uh, indices for delivery times across various countries. They really peaked in 2021. And now they're actually pretty close to being normal. And here's the long-term chart that I mentioned earlier. I said that uh, the recent strength of the dollar is um, you know, revisiting some of the peaks that we saw in the mid 1980s. Well, this is the chart for the BIS uh, real effective exchange rate for the dollar going back uh, 50 years. <laughs>
And you see that it's a W shape. Um, so the most recent peak in the dollar, um, it didn't quite break the record of early 1985, but it came close. And if we look at over the last 50 years, the recent period is really a period of quite a strong dollar. And to the extent that this is going to have an impact on financial conditions, banking activity in particular, uh, you know, this is going to impact the real side. Here's a zoomed in version. It's, it's monthly data. And essentially the dollar peaked at the end of October. And here are the bilateral exchange rates uh, against the major currencies. We've seen a little bit of a reversal of the decline in the dollar recently. And for those of you who follow financial markets, you will know that um, uh, the most recent macro data is showing um, somewhat the, uh, you know, a, a revival of some of the, um, uh, you know, some of the underlying inflation pressures uh, and the labor market is, um, is staying very strong, uh, especially in the US. But if you look at this chart um, and you believe that the dollar has peaked and we, we will uh, sort of gently uh, come down, this would, um, you know, point to trade receiving a boost over the, over the next few months. And this is going to be very much a, uh, a case of um, whether, you know, the, um, whether the, you know, this, this measure of the dollar as a barometer of global financial conditions is really going to, uh, you know, moderate. So let me uh, leave it there. And uh, thank you, Raphael, for, um, Raphael and Adam for, uh, for, for being discussants. Um, so Harrison, let me um, hand it back over to you. Great, uh, thanks, you. Uh, very provocative. Um, we're gonna have a lot to talk about uh, with, with the panelists and also with the audience. Uh, so let me kind of bring Jose uh, Shankman on to, to moderate the panel, Jose. Hi, <clears throat> thank you, Hugh. This was a spectacular lecture. Um, we have two panelists. Uh, Adam Raj is the director and head of uh, macro research at the Capital Fund Management, and is the person that helps us with all this data and so on, directs all this project. And then we have Raphael Shanley, who was a student at Princeton at the time we were all there, so and is now a professor at Brandeis. So let me start with Adam. Maybe I'll, I'll throw a question, which is that. All this data, you know, Hume's shown this very elaborate network. And I wanted to know to what extent this data, both in supply chains or, and perhaps on this elaborate network, is being used by for practitioners in the market. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, um, Jose, for the question, and thank you, uh, Hyun, for uh, for this great um, presentation. So, um, indeed, um, um, so so the the supply chains uh, are you know a very very timely subject, and maybe let me start by you know giving uh, you a few remarks uh, uh, from the point of view of an asset manager. So, you know, the supply chain disruptions. Uh, were one of the COVID reflationary forces and uh, that, that brought the inflation readings uh, uh, to heights that were uh, unseen since um, since early 80s. And, and not long ago, um, uh, they were also at the center of attention of many central bankers. And as, as Huna nicely pointed out, supply chains and global value chains are best um, described and visualized as networks, as webs of interconnections uh, between firms, uh, webs of interconnections that are complex and links that go a long way. So such networks can undergo disruptions um, caused by shocks to both supply or demand. And, and this, this, the shocks can propagate in complex ways because we're dealing with complex networks. So for example, you know, the bullwhip effect um, that you mentioned, uh, Posits that a, a small change uh, or, or relatively slight change in, in consumer demand can cause a lot of volatility up in the in upstream in in the value chain. So, so supply chain disruptions came into spotlight during COVID. Uh, COVID was a big uh, disruption. Uh, you know, initially the company the the economies have 
have uh, partially shut down and then there was a rebound in demand. Um, however, Hune works also demonstrate that, um, that the, the conditions of supply chains um, depend on uh, depend on other factors, factors like interest rate or the strength of the dollar. So for asset managers and, and, and investors, uh, it is important, it's very important to monitor um, uh, supply chains uh, and, and conditions of supply chains, simply because that helps to uh, prognosticate short to midterm trends in macroeconomic variables and by extension uh, in, in asset valuations. So just before I dive into data, um, I'd like to just maybe briefly mention how uh, the conditions of supply chains can affect asset valuations. Um, and so, and, and they, they work uh, themselves through various channels. So uh, a disruption to supply chains uh, of, 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 of pretty much any nature create uncertainties uh, along value chains and that may impact um, stock valuations. So, um, you know, on top of monitoring the uh, the disruptions, you also need to uh, know where the company that you're looking at is positioned within within the value chain. And then, you know, one of the hallmarks of globalization was was offshoring, and offshoring means uh, transportation. Uh, and then, you know, a sudden rise in transportation costs put upward pressure on things like cost of merchandise and commodity prices and by extension uh, can, can, can impact inflation. So, so that impacts commodity markets, uh, but also potentially bond markets. Uh, everything else equal, you know, rising transportation costs reduce margins and so could impact uh, stock valuations. And then recently, um, stockouts. So um, articles that are um, temporarily out of stock for consumers, um, they have been um, also linked uh, in academic literature to inflation. So how can you go about, you know, oh, so, so supply chain uh, overall are, are, are very relevant to global economy and, and, and to asset, uh, asset managers and to investment community. So how can you incorporate them in, in your investment process? Well, uh, as Hyun uh, uh, has shown, well, you have to start by building out a network. Uh, so you need to identify suppliers and, you know, all the upstream and downstream inter interdependencies. And, and in practice, you can, you know, use, uh, you can go about this in, in several ways. You can, uh, for example, look at regulatory filings to link up uh, the relevant companies um, together. There's generally many ways of setting up a network and, and some ways may be better to studying a problem at hand uh, than others. So, so this is, you know, you need to set up your, your network first. And then once you have your network set up, you can, you can start looking, say, all the way upstream and monitor things like geopolitical risk in the upstream country or region, uh, economic conditions uh, in that region, uh, business fundamentals, but also any disruptions that are happening. For example, um, COVID shutdowns in the upstream country. Then one notch below, um, you know, as I mentioned, offshoring means uh, inventory being moved between different geographical zones. And so you should be monitoring transportation costs, you know, uh, maritime freight rates, uh, container shipping, cargo, but also uh, air transportation and railroad transportation, and generally financial health of transportation companies in order to assess how much strain uh, they're able to shoulder. Also periodic business surveys, uh, uh, some of which uh, Hune mentioned are a good source of how smoothly supply chain function as you can, you can get an idea whether suppliers delivery times um, uh, deteriorate or improve. And finally, you know, a downstream measure uh, and interesting data you can look at is our, our stockouts. So, so articles that are temporarily out of stock, especially certain categories of stockouts um, uh, can be an early warning sign uh, that, that we're dealing with a disruption uh, along some value chains. Of course, you need to uh, adjust that for uh, uh, any possible shift in um, demand patterns. So overall, supply chains do matter uh, for global economy and 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 by extension uh, for 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 asset valuations and and using data uh, to monitor um, supply chains is very important. And you can use uh, the, the the insights that you glean uh, from that process from monitoring supply chains to to make better investment decisions. Thank you, and over to you, Harrison. Thank you, Adam. Just, uh, you know, just for our graduate students that are listening to this, you know, investors also matters for the outcomes of the economy. So you heard a lot of good hints about how to think about those network of supply that you have shown a, a place such a big role. Now, for Rafael, maybe I'll start the question 
really that I, that, that I would have interrupted you with if this is a normal, you know, if we're all in the same room, because it is an interesting question. So since this period in which, of course, um, the financial condition got worse and, and by measure by the dollar index, for instance, as measured by the dollar index, but it's also a period in which interest rates have been very low. So this be good if you have a low network. So something else was going on that in spite of the low interest rates um, made the economy um, um, kind of uh, made this change more what kind of lower the, the, the supply of those things. So I don't know if Rafael has something to say about this, or if you want to start with just some general discussions of Hume's point, we can come back to that if you don't. Yeah, no, thank you. I, unfortunately, some of your question broke up, but I, I, I think you, you were asking me about, um, you know, broadly speaking, other, other factors, in particular interest rates and monetary policy. So, so maybe I right. start start with the slide and it will pop up and I also have some something to add after I heard Adam's comments in, in one of my slides. Um, but feel free to, to you know poke me at some point when I when I hit that point. So so you know thanks for, for asking me to be uh, here to give some reactions and the usual disclaimer applies. Um, so um, in, in particular actually um, Harrison asked me to think about uh, some of the stuff that popped up at the end and of, of your talk, Hewan, which is uh, uh, in, inflation expectations and, and inflation. Um, and uh, let me start maybe right there, and it connects naturally to, to monetary policy too. Um, and also, I think it connects to this. I, I think it's a fantastic initiative to look at these large data sets, and I think that's exactly where we're going to learn a lot in the next years. I shamelessly connect to that too. Um, so here, um, to think about inflation and inflation expectations, um, um, you know, a, a key equation in, in macro is to think of along the Phillips curve, where inflation depends on, on, on expected future inflation. And here I'm showing you um, a figure which has the median inflation from 15 countries um, based on a data that I, I started uh, collecting with a um, a, a private survey company uh, while I was uh, building a center for inflation research at the Cleveland Fed. And uh, you can see quite in line with, with what um, you, you, uh, you, you sort of showed so nicely, uh, Jan, is that uh, in inflation expectations consistently uh, with uh, this uh, fall in, in inflation or decline with this global value joint. Uh, in particular, this is a global thing. So here, these, these very global uh, data set where we ask the same question in, in, in very disparate countries. I think there is some consistency uh, with that that story um, uh, where inflation and expected inflation have to be somewhat related. Um, but um, obviously there's more and maybe this goes into your um, uh, your question um, um, for say so so you know there's there's monetary policy and and the reaction there was fiscal stimulus was somewhat different across many countries. Um, and inflation expectations, which influence our beliefs and our actions, um, and and obviously asset prices, they they um, uh, they they're not always the same. So here I'm showing you what we get in the survey for Brazil, and you can see that in, in studying in, in 21, inflation expectations already started to come down. So there must be other factors uh, going on. And so if you sort of step back, people have done, and I think you had a chart from from one of these papers or these guys have have looked at sources. Uh, of drivers of inflation, there's a large chunk that is due to the supply shocks, but there is also a large chunk uh, that is not due to supply shocks. So coming from the demand side, which gives room to policy and uh, which policymakers have, have been talking about. Um, um, so maybe to go to more micro story of what's going on, I'm going to skip my second uh, reaction and maybe come back. So what, what do networks really do also, right? So we've talked about sort of the physical part of, of trade and I think networks do a lot more. There's information that travels along networks and this is true for firms, for individuals. And I think we really at the starting point of just being able to understand these better by virtue of having better data on linkages beyond these expectations, right? Of, of firms, prices, 
different input mixes, and balance sheet data. And it's really challenging, um, in particular at a high frequency if you ever work, work with these data. And I, I think Scandinavia and Chile probably have the best data. So I, you know, thinking about what, what to, to say here, it's like, I'm gonna be quick with two points. So one is there's a recent paper that exploits this amazing micro data from Chile where you can basically trace out at the firm level what firms um, think, what, what, what they use as an input mix. And you see that observed price changes along the supply chain actually affect their beliefs about inflation and their actions, in particular, their, their path through to prices and inflation. Um, and then also something I, um, that, that I've been working on um, on the consumer side uh, is to map out the beliefs uh, of consumers. But I think that sort of naturally generalizes to thinking about interactions between firms and, and people in firms. Um, so do inflation expectations also affect our expectations? So there's a, a network effect there and exploiting a really large data set in the US and also um, this Facebook data set that's floating around, we can at the very detailed level, zip code or county, relate expectations of individuals to not only their local observed expectations and inflation, but also sort of this network effect. Um, so thinking about the, the nice figures that you had, Tim, but if there's a there's a virtual uh, expectations dimension to that. And um, so going into detail, sort of this table shows you that this coefficient here, this beta two, is sort of in the first row and it comes out very significant and large relative to what you think uh, on average in, uh, is going on in, in your local county or, or the zip code level. So, so stepping you back. And in a minute, it will be great. Yes, uh, just to finish with the last comments, what it would suggest is that really networks convey a lot more information. Um, though that's really a very different factor from, um, you know, from monetary policy interventions and so on. Really, I think people's like beliefs do play a lot uh, uh, a large role, and um, you know, maybe for asset prices, um, this is very obvious. Um, I think there's a lot we need to learn and how these interact, especially on a global level when these really big events are happening. So I stop here. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, Hugh, I'll, I'll give it. You know. Maybe you have some comments on the comments. Maybe you want to get a little bit on the question I asked, whatever direction we go. Yeah, thank you, Adam and Raphael, for those uh, very good comments. Um, uh, maybe I can address your question first, Jose. I mean, you're asking, why is it that uh, when we look at this uh, sweep of history, when we've been through lots of different interest rate regimes, so you know, some periods have been marked with very high interest rates. Other periods have been marked with very low interest rates. Um, that, um, uh, and you, one would think that this is, you know, what's going to you know, drive some of the um, trade-offs, uh, you know, when we think about, um, you know, lengthening, lengthening the supply chain. And I guess, you know, what I could do, Jose, is actually, uh, so you know, if you if you go back to one of my earlier charts, it it does um, it does show how different these regimes have been. Um, so here we are. So we've seen lots of different kind of interest rate regimes throughout this this period from 1962 to the current. And uh, Jose is asking. Well, you know, we, we would expect when interest rates are low that the trade-off is more favorable towards value chains. When interest rates are high, that should kick in. Um, I think that's a very good starting point, Jose. But um, if we look at this period here, <clears throat> just before the GFC, you know, this was a period when uh, interest rates were actually reasonably high. It's when um, central banks were emerging from a very low rate. It's, and central banks were raising rates um, in the run-up to the GFC. Uh, but that's really when you see this biggest, uh, uh, you know, when you see this biggest run-up. And I guess what this tells us is that uh, uh, as well as the price, we have to think about the quantities here. Uh, you know, this was the period when banking was just expanding at tremendous pace. And um, the, um, the cost to the borrower as reflected in the financial system. Well, you know, someone must be borrowing, uh, you know, when balance sheets are expanding so much. 
So the marginal cost really does seem to be a function of how rapidly the how rapidly um, market liquidity is uh, you know is is evolving. But you're absolutely right that the that the rate um, of uh, but the interest rate as a kind of very deep variable is an important one to bear in mind. Um, and, that, and there's a very nice paper by Paul Antras uh, that um, uh, came out very recently where he's going back to the Austrian model of uh, value chains. And his idea is, well, you know, to the extent that these uh, roundabout production, the Austrians called, uh, talked about roundabout production where outputs are used as inputs into the next stage of production, then clearly the interest rate itself is going to be an important uh, factor in how roundabout that production is. Uh, and so uh, Paul is um, reviving that literature of um, the Austrian model of, uh, of trade. And um, certainly when we look at the, um, the broad sweep over long, long periods of time, you can certainly uh, imagine that some countries with structurally lower interest rates will have an advantage in having these very elaborate uh, supply chains than other countries that actually have very, very high um, you know, interest rates for you know, other fundamental reasons. I guess what's uh, interesting in the stuff that I've shown today is that not only is that a long-term structural issue, it seems to be playing out also at the business cycle frequency. Uh, again, you know, I think that is the interesting part that it looks as if this is playing out at you know, a frequency of three to five years uh, rather than 50 years. And uh, it gives a kind of you know, new complexion to the stories of macro fluctuations. You know, one of the puzzles in macro, uh, as you know, is this idea of the excess volatility puzzle, which is that countries that trade with each other tend to have um, GDP correlations, which are much higher than can be explained by real business cycle models. Um, and you need something like correlated TFP shocks to, to really fit the data. And um, um, I didn't have time to, to discuss this, but if you write down these value chain models and think about roundabout production here, there is something that looks like TFP that depends on financial conditions. So if you solve the model, you look at the TFP term, uh, it actually turns out that that TFP term is a bunch of endogenous things that actually depend on financial conditions. And I think that's a very, um, so for, for the students who are you know, tuning in, um, I think a very, very good topic uh, to look at would be, you know, um, to what extent can these financial stories tell um, the full story of um, the excess volatility, excess correlation and GDP that we see? Uh, much higher than you know you can actually engineer with simple real business cycle models. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Now we can open up to just general. Audience. So we can open the questions. Well, I'm happy to start with a question. I'm happy to start with a question. If uh... so, so again, this is Noemi. She's a. Uh... Hi, go ahead, go ahead. Hi, nice to meet you. Yeah, I had like, um, my question was, how do you think about um, welfare? Is it like finance is just part of the marginal cost of trade? And so marginal revenue is equated to marginal cost and we're in the first welfare theorem kind of world, or is it some friction um, that, that exists? And, and if so, what, what is the type of underlying friction that policymakers would, would be willing to address? That's a great question. Um... I didn't talk at all about welfare, but um, that's definitely worth thinking about. So um, if you look at this chart, which is the broad sweep of global trade, to the extent that um, a lot of this is being driven by financial conditions, I think it's a reasonable question to ask whether um, at certain points in time, the global value chains are too elaborate. You know, it's actually going to be, you know, just far too elaborate than would be justified. 
uh, in a steady state. And you could argue, I mean, arguably this bit here, 2005, 2006, 2007, this was a period when financial conditions were very, very loose um, and all kinds of things were happening. And if the value chain is only sustainable at um, levels of financial conditions that clearly are not sustainable, then arguably, you know, that trade is not real, uh, you know, that, that trade is not really sustainable trade either. And you could even think about bubbles in global value chains. Um, so what that would suggest is, um, you know, if you have some idea of the shocks that uh, hit global um, financial conditions, and uh, you can make an ex-ante calculation as to, you know, what level of GVC sophistication is going to maximize ex-ante welfare, you could arguably reach, um, uh, you know, the answer that you're better off with something which is more robust, something which is more resilient uh, and is not going to be overextended um, uh, and is vulnerable to financial shocks. It's a bit like leverage itself. So, you know, when margins are very, very thin, leverage is very high, uh, it could be that that's great. I mean, uh, you know, people can do a lot more, but if that is vulnerable to shocks and, you, you know, it's vulnerable to margins going up and therefore deleveraging, you can do the ex-ante calculation. And, uh, you know, it's perfectly reasonable to think that, uh, you know, with the right probabilities of these shocks, you may uh, well be better off with, uh, with a more resilient system. And in a way, this is where the discussion is going right now. Um, I mean, it's motivated by more than the economics. Uh, it's really a question of how do we have a global trading system that is less subject to these um, bottlenecks and shocks. Um, there's also a geopolitical overlay to this, of course, because you know what you want to do is to make sure that your essential supplies, semiconductor supplies, uh, you know, in particular, are not subject to, you know, your political constraints. That may not, and and if that's the case, then you may be better off having a more resilient uh, value chain. Uh, that's closer to home and uh, less elaborate. So th that welfare calculation, I think, is a very interesting one. And uh, depending on how you, you know, go about doing that, it's going to be yielding quite interesting answers, I would say. Great. So thank you very much for super insightful. Good question on that, um, sort of in that vein. So is it your the financial crisis played a role in terms of causal effect, you know, in terms of the coincidence of global finance and global trade that the GFC, by sort of leading to this kind of decade of maybe more, more financial regulation and the tamping down of, of leverage, that that might have led to an endogenous shortening of supply chains or less 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 trade is that your view that there's like this, this kind of i think positive? that's certainly a possibility harrison so uh, i'm not sure that everyone heard harrison's question harrison's question is uh, could this period here leading up to the gfc and the subsequent bus could that have had an impact all the way to what's happening currently and to some extent i think the answer is yes because the whole banking sector was really refashioned after the crisis uh, you know, we had Basel III. Uh, in fact, this is the reason why during the COVID shock in 2020, whereas the non-banks, whereas market finance was seeing a, a, a great deal of stress, the banks were actually doing remarkably well and they were playing this buffering role. And um, to that extent, I think what we see is uh, something which looks a lot more resilient and is better you know, able to buffer shocks. And so in the uh, welfare calculation that I um, you know, laid out in the, in the previous question, if you think that uh, you know, resiliency is an important feature that uh, you know, should be an objective of policy, then uh, you, know, you may well choose a system that actually has those features. So um, I don't think that, uh, that I, um, so the short answer is, uh, of course, you know, no one knows. 
but um, there does seem to be something going on here where when we look at the broad sweep of the banking system, and here is primarily the banking system that's going to be backing up the trade. Um, something happened during the GFC. And ever since, you know, we've seen um, the pre-crisis behavior not really return. And given the fragilities that we saw, uh, and this was going, you know, this is going back to our Princeton days, Harrison. Uh, you know, when when we were looking at the, all the all the uh, pieces falling around our ears, um, that may be a good thing if we can have resiliency as part of uh, you know as as part of the system. And I would say that you know um, I would sort of uh, also you know just draw to the just draw to everyone's attention that the, most of that happens here in Basel. You know, um, in my building sits the Basel Committee. On banking supervision. So this is where most of those discussions happen. Yeah, I, I, I just had one question. Um, just wanted to get your sense of what the role of uh, China is at this. So, really, when I was looking at the graph, it seemed that the rise in uh, exports to GDP really started in the 70s, uh, whereas you know, China really only opened up in the post 2000s. And that seemed to be maybe just a small part of that rise. And that yeah. also tied to maybe my understanding of you know the COVID supply chain shock. A lot of it seems to be tied to what's happening in China with the lockdowns and things like that. And I wonder if you think that that is a major issue given what we're seeing in terms of the longer term trends. Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, um, you know, if you look at this chart that's currently on the screen, it actually addresses some of your you know some of your uh, some of your points. The point um, that, that really sort of strikes. Uh, you know the viewer when you look at this um, this chart that uh, breaks out exports by sector. It's the manufacturing sector that that is really driving the globalization of trade. It's this gray bar uh, that is increasing. Uh, you know, not uh, simply in real terms, but as a proportion of GDP, it is growing at a tremendous pace. And um, the growth in manufacturing trade was there even before. You know China's accession to the WTO, but it was really very much more accelerated. Uh, you know, with with China's uh, accession, you can see something of that if you look at this chart. This is just the aggregate um, goods exports to GDP, and it's really um, so. You know, there is this first period here uh, up to the mid 70s, then it sort of flatlines pretty much. But then it's really the 2000s. This is when, you know, um, late 90s, 2000s, this is when you see this huge increase. And, um, and uh, people like Richard Baldwin uh, at Geneva and others, you know, they've, they've pointed out that uh, China's incorporate, you know, China's accession to the WTO being um, enmeshed in the global value chains, that really was a game changer in terms of manufacturing trade. Yeah, so um, uh, so I guess you know th that's the big picture. That's the kind of you know, longer term picture. Um, the recent wiggles, yeah. I mean, that's. Uh, I think we should think about that against the backdrop of this longer term trend. Are there any other questions? Raphael has a comment. Yes. Uh, very briefly, but I, I'd be super interested um, to know, Hyun, to what extent you know. Thinking about networks, to what extent is this just like a handful of firms? There's this insight that, that I'm that we're seeing more and more that it's really about granularity, just a handful of firms, you know, superstar firms, whatever you want to call them, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's within countries, across countries. And what are the margins that are really happening here? And do you know yeah. anything in, in terms of how this connects to finance? Yeah, absolutely. So these are the uh, network charts that I showed. I, I hope you can see the screen here. And, um, you know, this is from Capital IQ. Um, what they have is a very interesting um, um, addendum to their data set where they actually ask firms who their direct counterparties are uh, as suppliers and as customers. And so, you know, when they, when they answer the survey, they actually write down uh, the name of the firm. So you can actually map out uh, this type of network 
Now, um, what uh, you see here, um, so remember each of these circles is a firm and the size of the circle is the balance sheet. It's the total assets of that firm. And um, this is, uh, you know, these are network charts that are, that are arranged according to sector. So the red here is the information technology sector. The green is the automobile and component sector, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you can, you know, pretty much piece together who these firms are. And of course, you know, we have all the details, but you see that, uh, you know, there are some pretty central firms. Uh, so here there are some red firms, which are in the IT sector. The following chart, it gives you um, the breakdown in terms of, uh, you know, where they come from. So these red dots here are IT firms that come from Korea. There are two big ones. And I think you can guess, you know, which, which of these two are. There are also um, IT firms that come from the US. So here's a really big one. And there's a bunch of smaller ones. And it's all enmeshed into one very complicated uh, value chain. And um, we know what, you know, who these firms are, uh, you know, their household names. There are countries like Germany, uh, which are very, very important in the manufacturing sector. They're very highly integrated both with uh, firms in Asia as well as uh, in the United States. And so if we track the manufacturing sector, um, we can tell some really interesting stories. And um, I don't think that you know, this data set has been fully utilized, Raphael, but I, um, I suspect that uh, you know, if you really dig into this, uh, you know, there may be something useful that comes from that. Um, thank you, Hugh. Thank, thank you, Rafael. I'm going to leave the final word to add, but before I do that, I really want to thank you, Hugh, for, for a great lecture and bringing so many of those questions. I'm sure a lot of our students can work with this stuff. By the way, is this network from the BIS publicly available? Um, it's not publicly available, but but it's all public. But it's all based on public data. Actually, um, if you're if you're interested, um, um, what we could do. I mean, you know, we, we have a quarterly review piece that is coming out. These charts are actually from one of those quarterly review pieces. It's going to be uh, public at the end of the month. But for those of you who are familiar with this data, uh, I mean the. The real trick is to plot, uh, you know, the centrality. Uh, is to calculate the centrality, because you, you need to find uh, the fixed point when you do that calculation. And not all of the uh, mathematical packages are great at that. You need a specialist package. I've forgotten the name of the package that uh, uh, that my colleagues used, but there is a specialist package that is, you know, uh, tailored to do this kind of fixed point calculation. And so once you have that centrality measure, then the rest is pretty easy because then you can just uh, you know, put uh, edges between terms and then it's just the size of the circle. Thank you, Hugh, again, Adam. Do we still have time for one more question? Um, the last question, Adam. We have the last question if you All want. right, yeah. great. Uh, so I, I, is, to, to pivot, uh, pivot a little bit more to data that Hugh was, was just talking about and, and picking up on what Raphael, um, showed in, in his reaction. So I, I'd like to kind of bring up that, that there's, you know, the, it's, it's important to, to, to kind of map out the supply chains but, but that, and, and, and study supply chains, but that comes with a lot of challenges because, you know, for example, some company links may be trade secrets. So, you know, we might be looking at partial networks and, and maybe miss some uh, important links. And, you know, you can supplement that analysis with a bottom-up analysis that can help you with the inference process and, and make the networks that you're looking at uh, more complete. So reveal more of, 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 of that network. But, and then, but then also companies within network are not all the same. They're heterogeneous. For example, they don't all manage, you know, inventory in the same way across different industries. And, and then there is a the whole problem of timeliness of data. So some data, uh, is timely, like transportation costs, you can get pretty much, uh, uh, you know, daily or weekly. Whereas, uh, and, and, uh, and same with some risk metrics, uh, geopolitical risk, uh, policy risk, political risk, that's something you can um, get a handle on uh, pretty much on a, on a daily or weekly basis. But some other data is not that timely. So for example, mm. amounts of goods 
flowing along the value chain or say any informed potential bottlenecks brewing up there somewhere can become available with you know substantial lag and and, and only you know have low frequency to it and then finally yeah. you know uh, shocks and distortions you know when they propagate through a complex network they propagate with a lag it takes some time for the shock to kind of their all the ripple ways to reach the entire network so so while there is some you know typically some what what, what Hume called the buffer stock a quantity of final inventory uh, available, uh, but the distortions really affect the inventory in transit. So uh, I was, uh, I'll be happy to hear uh, Hune's uh, thought on that. And I guess, you know, we all need to be tapping into more data sources in order to have a more complete pic picture. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Adam. I think you're pointing to some really important topics here. The, I mean, this chart, uh, we're just relying on S&P uh, capital IQ. So, you know, it's a standard corporate uh, data set. It actually has this module for the counterparties, uh, customers uh, and suppliers. Now, to, to, the ex to what extent that's a complete, uh, you know, record? Uh, I mean, that's really, yeah. I mean, you know, as you say, they, there could be some missing links. Um, but to the extent that uh, the biggest effects are going to come from the biggest exposures, um, and here exposures really means, uh, you know, who's, um, uh, you know, if you look at your receivables, what are the biggest receivables, um, you know, who are the counterparties for your biggest receivables, and who are the biggest counterparties for your payables. You know, this is an area, trade finance, which is a little bit of a backwater. It's, um, it's taught um, actually by your uh, colleagues in the business school that look at, you know, supply chain management and so on, but less in the mainstream economics uh, literature. But I think it's something that definitely deserves more attention from economists because um, it really points to some of the big macro features um, that can you know, show up when you have macro fluctuations. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so this is uh, gonna be a wrap on uh, the exciting lecture. And, and a lot of great panel questions. And uh, so we'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much, Ian. Have a great evening. Thank thanks, you. Harrison. Thank you, uh, Thank you thanks, everyone. Jose. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Great event. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.